The immense history of Ireland is like the many raging horses of the Sons of Lear, rising, falling, and ever obscuring the great depths beneath. In historical sources, Gaelic origins are so blended with myth that there can be no separation of the two. The era before the coming of the Sons of Mida is a fleeting dream, and the time of mighty Con Caed Cathach a vision. Even the time of glorious Níl Nínoinneolach, perhaps the fourth century, blurs into legend. The goddess Eru has not always been so kind to the Gael who dwells in her bosom. They have suffered much, but they have endured, preserving the memory and line of their ancestors even into these dark times of Erdaha. For some, even those many millions who are descendants of Irish immigrants to the Americas, Ireland is the land of leprechauns and St. Patrick. There are also numerous negative stereotypes, many likely the remnants of those promoted by their English colonial rulers. They were frequently depicted in the media of the 19th century as besotted apes, and some early evolutionary racialists promoted the idea that the Irish Celts were a rude barbarian race more related to Cro-Magnum man than modern humans, a sort of missing link in the imagined evolutionary chain. By some, it was believed that they hadn't even lived in Ireland very long, being only refugees from Gaul who fled from Julius Caesar. Others believed they were the descendants of the very earliest humans that settled in Ireland, the builders of the Neolithic monuments such as Newgrange. But what are their true origins? Who really are the Irish? Hi friends, I'm Kevin McLean. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and consider supporting the channel through Patreon, PayPal, and through YouTube Super Stickers. Your support helps me to make videos like this. Much thanks to all of my supporters. Ireland has been inhabited for a long time, but not nearly as long as most of Europe. Though there are some signs that humans were present there as early as 31,000 BC, these were small bands of nomadic hunters crossing the great ice sheets that still covered northern Europe at that time. It wasn't until around 10,500 BC that there are, is more consistent evidence for human activity, and not until around 8,000 BC in the Mesolithic era that we have evidence for widespread permanent settlement. These were groups of hunter-gatherers who made their way to the island during the late Paleolithic likely in small boats. By 4,500 BC, however, these people had largely been replaced by another incoming group, the Neolithic farmers. Perhaps Ireland's most famous ancient site, Newgrange, was made by them. Genetic studies have shown that the early hunter-gatherer male lineage may have been a significant factor in the ruling elite of these people which has some interesting implications for the early interactions between these two groups. Yet neither of these people are the significant direct ancestors of the modern Irish. By 2500 BC, a new people were arriving on the shores of Ireland. They were highly advanced in the construction of ships, which they rowed across the waves like horses yet they would not dream of eating seafood. They were young men, warriors, bows in hand, copper daggers, spears, and axes at the ready. But they were also skilled craftsmen, early smiths, carpenters, shipwrights, and miners. These people are known to us now as the Bell Beakers, based on the early designs of some of their pottery. What they might have called themselves isn't known but they were Indo-Europeans, speakers of a language related to Irish and English, Latin, Russian, and Persian. Genetic studies have revealed that it was primarily this group of people who went on to form the genetic basis for the modern Irish. The Bell Beakers are responsible for many Bronze Age sites in Ireland, including the vast majority of stone circles and henge monuments. As I cover in a video dedicated to Stonehenge, the Bell Beakers were henge creators. Whether or not one agrees that they were the original creators of Stonehenge, 
They were indisputably the last to arrange the stones as we know them today. And they created many other henges, stone circles, massive mounds, and other structures across Britain and Ireland in the Chalcolithic and Early Bronze Age. These henges and stone circles were not only made of stones, but also wooden posts and banks and ditch enclosures. They represented a delineation of sacred space, moving from outside to inside, similar to an enclosed temple. They built their own houses in the same shape that they laid out their sacred spaces. The round houses which Britain and Ireland and parts of Iberia are so well known for. Their customs and language would have been little different to that spoken throughout Central Europe at that time, and the Bell Beakers spread that speech into Italy and as far as Iberia. They lived in small communities led by local kings, raised cattle, hunted, mined ore, and produced brilliant golden artifacts still admired today. Their shipbuilding was some of the most advanced anywhere in Europe, and studies of gold and tin ore suggest that they were using these ships to trade precious cargo as early as 2200 BC along the coasts and down riverways. Their ritual activities suggest that they also may have functioned on a national level. They built a sacred site at Tara, a massive timber circle that some have compared to Stonehenge. The site, known as Tower in Gaelic, is etymologically connected to the ancient Greek word temenos, a word for a sacred site separated off from the ordinary world by a wall, trench, or river. The typical name for a Gaelic sanctuary is Nieva, related to Gaulish Nemeton, and it suggests perhaps that the name of Tower may have been inherited from the Bell Beaker period name for the site. In myth, it is named for the daughter of Lui, who is married to the first Gaelic king of all Ireland, Erevon. It's possible that nearly all the beliefs of the Gaels concerning ancient places or ancient customs comes not from the Celts, but from the Bell Beaker ancestors who settled Ireland in the Chalcolithic, replacing the earlier Neolithic farmers. The reason for this is complex and relates to the question of the origins of the Celts and how the Irish became speakers of a Celtic language. While we do not know exactly what the culture of the Irish Bell Beakers was like, it was probably not far different to the Celts, who developed from a similar Bell Beaker population in Central or Western Europe. The question of the Celts is critical to understanding the ethnogenesis of the Gaels, the ethnic Irish. Sometime between the Chalcolithic and when the first accounts of the Irish people and place names are recorded by the Greek cartographer Ptolemy in AD 150, the inhabitants of Ireland had come to speak a Celtic language. Some, such as renowned archaeologist Sir Barry Cunliffe, put forward a theory which they called Celtic from the West which suggests that the Celtic language actually developed along the Atlantic coast from Britain and Ireland to Iberia. The Indo-European dialect of these early settlers eventually evolved into Celtic and was spread westward by migrations, invasions, trade, and culture. While this is a minority view among scholars, there are a few interesting points to consider. According to Julius Caesar, the Druids believed that their order, or at least certain teachings among them, originated in Britain, and that many wishing to learn Druidic knowledge would travel there to study. Ammianus Marcadinus, a Roman writing in the 4th century AD, reported on the account of an earlier Greek historian and ethnographer, Timogenes, who wrote a work titled On the History of the Gauls which now survives only in fragments through Marcellinus's recollection. Timogenes was known to have been taken as a slave by the Romans in 55 BC, which roughly dates his work. His account of the beliefs of the Druids was likely recorded just following the Roman occupation of Gaul. He said, The Druids affirm that a portion of the people was really indigenous to the soil, but that other inhabitants poured in from the islands on the coast, 
and from the districts across the Rhine, having been driven from their former abodes by frequent wars, and sometimes by inroads of the tempestuous sea. This account is similar, yet different, to what Julius Caesar records, and therefore is independent testimony claiming that the Druids in Gaul believed that the Britons and the Irish, for the account says islands, were responsible for at least part of the ethnic origins of the Gauls. Of course, just because the Druids believed this doesn't mean that it was true, but they were the most learned men of their day, responsible for upholding the ancient knowledge and passing it down through intensive memorization. Numerous Irish legends recount kings who were said to have led war bands into the continent, conquering territory, and within the historical period we know that the Irish established settlements all along the British coast. Perhaps these are fanciful myths, but perhaps there is some truth to them. It could be that the British and Irish Balbeakers were like Bronze Age Vikings or early Greeks, spreading the Proto-Celtic language through raiding and settling along the coasts and river systems of Gaul and Iberia. However, the more likely and more widely accepted view is that the Celtic language originated somewhere in Central or Western Europe and spread along with the expansion of the Urnfield culture in the late Bronze Age. There are only very small genetic shifts within the population of Ireland between the start of the Bronze Age and the medieval period, so a large-scale ethnic replacement of the Bell Beaker population never happened. Instead, warrior bands from the continent would have conquered territories and spread the language and culture through their political dominance. This process would have been facilitated by the fact that the language and culture of the Belbeakers wouldn't have been vastly different from Proto-Celtic, making assimilation far easier. However, aside from adopting the language and cultural forms like the Druids and Bards, the Irish remained fundamentally the same group that had settled the land in 2500 BC, and many of their tales of the land likely date well back into the Bronze Age. The earliest writings from Ireland are unambiguous about their identity. Though there were hundreds of tribes and kings, they were all Gaels, pronounced in Old Gaelic, Gaithil, and they spoke a common language, Goithelk, Gaelga today, for which they held a great love. They also recognized that they were referred to as Scoti by others, but generally they only referred to themselves as this when writing in Latin, as that was how those in the Latin-speaking world outside knew them. It's argued that Goithel was adopted from the Brythonic language, Gwithel, meaning woodsman, or wild man, possibly originating from the Roman and post-Roman period when Gaels were raiding and settling along the Welsh coasts. The famous King Neil of the Nine Hostages is recorded in legend as having participated in those raids, which were elevated by storytellers into the conquest of Britain and beyond, from which he acquired nine hostages from his defeated foes. Whatever the etymological beginnings of the name may have been, it was given a detailed origin in a complicated history recorded in what is called the Book of the Taking of Ireland, Leurgavale Erin, though first written down in full in the 11th century. Many of its ideas can be found in earlier sources. One such significant source is the 9th century Historia Britonum by British Nennius. The saint recounts events very similar to that recorded by later Gales, which he professes to have learned from scholars from Ireland. It is shaped by Christian theology, but contains hints of an earlier pre-Christian origin. The story begins with the tale of Adam's fall and then the great flood. After the flood, the sons of Noah went to the various regions of the world, this is the Christian version of the creation of the separate racial groups. Thus the legend says, Sem settled Asia, Ham settled Africa, and Japheth, or Yefe in Gaelic, settled all Europe, but not only Europe, 
also Anatolia, Medea, Armenia, and all the lands settled by the Scythians. To the medieval European, the people of these regions were understood to be of the same originating stock and shared physical and cultural characteristics. Magog, son of Japheth, was said to be the ancestor of the various tribes of gods and other beings reframed in the tales as earlier population groups who inhabited Ireland before the Gaels. This is in keeping with the story of Gog and Magog as the enemies of the Christian god. And it's from Bath, the son of Ibath, son of Gomer, son of Japheth, that the Gaels trace their origin. The Hebrew name Gomer refers to the ancient Chimerians who dwelt in southern Russia, an Iranian people. However, ancient Roman Jewish historian Josephus said that Gomer was the founder of the people which the Greeks call Galatians, the Celts of Anatolia who appear in the New Testament. Jerome and Isidora of Seville followed Josephus in this view. And it's possible that the early Gaels trace their origin to this figure for this exact reason. In any case, it was believed by the Gaelic historian that Bath, son of Magog, was the progenitor of all the Scythian peoples. According to the Lower Gavala, Phineas Pharisee was the son of Bath. His name is developed from the word Pheni, which refers to a freeborn landholding Gael, and Pharisee from the Hebrew Pharisee. He had two sons, one he left as ruler of Scythia, and the other, Nel, meaning cloud, he brought with him to the Tower of Nimrod. After God divided all the languages of the world, Nel wed Scotia, an Egyptian Greek princess, and their child was Goithel, often called Goithel Glass, said to be from the green color that he turned after being bitten by a snake. And Goithel then formed Gaelic from the 72 languages of the world. In another account, contained within the Oum Primer, dating to as early as the 7th century, says that Goithel was living in southwest Egypt at that time, and was called a Scythian Greek. He went to the creation of the tower, and made the Gaelic language, then inscribed it in stones in Mesopotamia, making it the first language to be written down. While in Athens, Goithel, together with his relatives, Phineas Pharisi and Ir, formed the five ancient dialects of Gaelic. The language of the Feni, the nobility, the language of the rump folk, the language of the separation between the trees, a form taught in bardic training, trees here referring to vowels, and the language of the Fili, the poetic language and finally, the common language. While we don't know many details about this division between high and low language, it may have been something like what existed in ancient Rome between the classical written language and that spoken by commoners on the street, which is sometimes referred to as vulgar Latin. After this, the descendants of Goethe returned to Scythia from Egypt, and a bloody civil war rages for a number of generations. Agnoman and his two sons Lavind and Alwa were the generation to finally leave Scythia. They were guided by Cachar, meaning one-eyed, the druid, the son of a brother of Agnoman. Yet they do not go to Ireland, but rather settle in Iberia, instructed to do so by Cachar. The Gaels reside in Iberia for generations, until one clear winter day, Ich, brother of the king of Galatia, Bile, son of Breogan, looks out of the Tower of Heracles and catches a faint glimpse of Ireland beyond the waves. He sets out with his son Louis and arrives in Ireland, which at that time was ruled by the three sons of Kermit, after the murder of Lou. Macu, Maccecht, Macgrain. Ich pays a visit to the kings, and as an excellent judge, he helps settle the dispute between them. But feeling suspicious about the stranger's intentions, after praising Ireland so highly, the three decide to murder him. Where he fell became known as the Plain of Ich. 
His son Louis manages to escape back to Spain with the body of his father and convinces his cousins, the sons of Golov, more commonly known as Mile, to avenge their uncle with him. Eber, Erevon, Don, Erach, Ir, Aranan, Amurgin, and Kolfa. After struggling against great magic which drowns Dawn in a great storm, at the island of Dawn, off the coast, the children of Golov, meaning Spear Hand, defeat the Tuatha de Danann in a battle on the field of Taltu. Eber is made ruler of Southern Ireland and Erevon the North, but after a few years the brothers go to war. Eber falls and Erevon is made the first High King. From his line come nearly all of the Gaels, except those who come from the line of Lui, son of Ich. This is the general outline of the origins of the Gaels that was formulated at least by the 8th century, and which was believed for many hundreds of years. It's obviously the product of a Latin-educated Christian mind, but it's drawing on an original myth that's insufficiently disguised. Lavind, son of Agnoman, is confused with Neva, son of Agnoman, which leads a separate invasion of Ireland, and who may be cognate with the god Nuada. Cacher, one eye, called a druid, and his brother King, meaning warrior, who guide their cousins, are suspiciously akin to the Irish brother saints known in France as Lugle and Luglien, one of whom is a one eyed bishop and the other a warrior king who calms storms on the sea and calls forth floods and rains. In the Dinshenhas, the god Lug is once called the son of Cachir. That Golov, Spearhand, is the son of Bile, sacred tree, brother of Ich, grain, is very suspicious. Likely Bile is cognate with the Welsh ancestral figure, Beli, both names originating from Proto-Celtic Belium, tree, meaning the cosmic tree of many Indo-European traditions. In another poem, Erevon is said to have led the Gaels not out of Spain, but out of Hell. He has a son called Iriul Faig, meaning the seer, who becomes High King, but who is also known as Nuahu Aragidlav, about whom the Book of the Taking of Ireland itself says, for what learned men say is that every princely family that is in Ireland, save the Ogentacht, is of the seed of Nuahu Ergetla. In other words, while a very elaborate tale has been spun about the origins of the Gaels to try and Christianize them, the fact is that the Gaels originally believed that they were the descendants of the gods, and that they first came into Ireland from the underworld. Very likely they believed that they were the first humans, just as the Greeks, Hebrews, and Japanese believed of themselves. This relates directly to Julius Caesar's comments about the beliefs of the Gauls. All the Gauls assert that they are the descendants of the god Dis, and say that this tradition has been handed down by the Druids. For that reason they compute the division of every season, not by the number of days, but of nights. Don, who drowns before reaching Ireland, and for whom the island called Tech Don is named, may be such a figure. He is several times identified as the King of the Sons of Mire, and his house is said in the Dinshenhas to be the place where heathens believe the spirits of the dead gales go, but that those of great honor don't stay there, but only observe it from a distance. The island has a hole clear through it, large enough to sail a ship through, and through such holes in stones, spirits were believed to cross between worlds. Like the Celts in Gaul and Britain, the Gaels were organized into a very hierarchical society, in which one's rank was largely hereditary. Like in Gaul, there were bards, the highest rank of which were known as the Fili. There were also the Druids and the Vates, or Fath in Old Gaelic. The society was highly centered 
around the king and his rule according to the right, the proper ordering of things established by the gods. Every Tua, or tribe, had their own king, who was in various alliances with kings of other tribes, and at least on a theological level, this extended up to the Ardri, the High King, ruler of all the Gales, though until the medieval period they did not possess a powerful centralized force, but had a type of jurisdiction concerning law and administrating sacred rites. Gaelic society was nearly identical with the society of pre-Roman Gaul described by ancient Greeks, yet more archaic. Before the arrival of Christianity, it had existed and developed in near total isolation. The only significant outside interactions were with Britons, or more rarely, Gauls. They still lived in a world where just over the horizon dwelt the realms of the gods, a world akin to that preserved in the Odyssey. They may have used iron tools, but their worldview and their culture was still entirely Bronze Age. This comes out strongly in the earliest Gaelic literature. Even in Christian tales, St. Brendan the Navigator sails into a strange realm, much like Odysseus finds, searching for the other world. Many of the early kings known from literature are more mythical than real, and it's difficult to know which of the early kings actually refer to men and which are euhemerized gods. One such is Conhovar king of Ulster, who ruled from Ewin Macha. He is said to have died on the same day as Jesus, baptized by his own blood, and was the first Gael to ascend to heaven. Archaeological excavations date the creation of the palatial complex on the site to roughly the time when many sources say that he lived, the early 1st century AD. Shortly after, the site was buried in a massive mound. If he was a real king, he was likely divinized after death, or believed to be the incarnation of a god. It was said of him, he was a god to the Ulster men. Connacht is said to be named for Con the Cathach of the Hundred Battles. His great-grandson, according to some accounts, Níl Nanoinielach of the Nine Hostages, is a great father of later dynastic kings and said to have led conquests of Britain and Europe, from whom he obtained the nine hostages. This is likely in part a reflection of reality in the time which he is believed to hail from, corresponding to the collapse of the Roman Empire. Gales from Ireland swept across not only raiding, but settling along the coasts of Britain. They established a significant power base in Gwynedd, and they greatly expanded Gaelic domination in Scotland, which had likely been present even before this, but they pushed further into Argyll and Galloway. Those in Wales were eventually absorbed into Welsh kingdoms or driven out, but in the north they eventually overcame the Picts and established the Kingdom of Scotland. Through the actions of Christians such as St. Patrick, the Gaels gradually adopted Christianity. But other than bishops and priests taking the position of druids, the construction of Christian churches and burial rites, little else changed initially in Ireland. However, Ireland had very much opened up to the world, and its scholars, monks, and missionaries were punching far above their weight throughout the Christian world. In 795, the Viking raids began, and in the early 800s, Vikings began to settle in Ireland, in places like Dublin and Limerick. A sizable amount of Norse words were adopted into Gaelic. There were 200 years of frequent battles between Gaels and the Norse for control over Ireland, but though having some initial success, the Norse never managed to obtain the same level of power in Ireland that they achieved in Britain. Around the year 1000, High King Brian Baru managed to break the Norse political power in Ireland. Though some Norse continued to reside in Ireland in communities like Dublin, they lost much of their political independence and were gradually absorbed by the Gaels. Around 150 years after Brian's much celebrated victory, a new invader would appear. 
In 1169, the first Anglo-Norman mercenary fleet landed on Irish shores, not on their own initiative, but at the request of the deposed King of Leinster, Diarmid MacMurchada, who sought to return to power, betraying his people and desiring only power. He swore loyalty to King Henry II in return for his support and promised lands to Norman lords. The historical account is strangely similar to that of the mythical Gaelic tale Cahmag Turith, where Bres, the deposed king, recruits the Fomorians to return him to the throne in exchange for allowing them to enslave the Irish, leading some to think the tale was reformed from an earlier myth in order to make a specific political statement. Yet the traitor Diarmid ruled for only two years before dying just long enough to marry his daughter off to the Earl of Pembroke, Richard Strongbow de Clare. Strongbow had been promised Diarmut's daughter and the kingship of Leinster after Diarmut's death, and he had received the strong financial backing of Jose of Gloucester, a Jewish merchant in England. He conquered Dublin in 1070, and just a year later claimed all the lands of Diarmut and the kingship of Leinster upon his death in violation of Irish law. Perhaps Diarmid's early death wasn't only a coincidence. These series of events would lead to over 700 years of violent struggle for the political independence and the very survival of the Gales of Ireland. The Catholic Church in England and France was heavily involved in pushing for the invasion of Ireland. They saw the Irish Church as acting outside the norms and outside of their own control, delaying or refusing to implement the Gregorian reforms. St. Bernard, co-founder of the Knights Templar, described the Irish as barbaric, semi-pagan, and in strong need of reform. And a Welsh account from even after the Anglo-Norman invasion records a horse sacrifice at the coronation of a king with details so strongly corresponding to Indo-European horse sacrifice ritual that the account could not have been a fictional slander. All this gave a Christian moral justification and church support for the Anglo-Norman conquest. In October 1171, Henry II of England went himself into Ireland. One of his primary targets was Cashel, the seat of the Munster kings. There he demanded a synod of the Irish church he lambasted them, claiming that they were in violation of Roman right, and demanded that they submit to him. Pope Alexander III issued an order to the Irish bishops, instructing them to accept Henry as their overlord, or be ecclesiastically censored. The English then gained near total power over the Irish church. They enforced Roman monastic rules and church laws, and they brought the Knights Templar to enforce by sword the English rule and root out anything they believed pagan. The dramatic change in the Irish clergy did not happen overnight, but by the 18th century it is possible to read Irish priests write about how early Irish monks were guilty of heresy and blasphemy for writing such works as the Lewer Gavala. Probably every English speaker has heard the term beyond the pale. What few perhaps know is that the term referred to Ireland. The pale was the region where the English king held direct power in Ireland, primarily around the region of Dublin. It was protected by a large ditch and fortified ramparts, thus the name pale from Latin pale, meaning wall. Within the pale, Irish dress, language, and intermarriage with English was made illegal. Beyond the Pale were the lands controlled by the Gaels and the Anglo-Norman lords, where the control of England was very weak. Of course, the term is used in a negative sense, suggesting it is something mad, barbaric, something only a savage Gael would do. It's beyond the Pale. Yet for hundreds of years after the Anglo-Norman conquest, most of Ireland was beyond the pale. Local Irish kings had to swear fealty to the English crown, provide up taxes, but 
Otherwise, they still carried on in the traditional Gaelic fashion. Over time, the Anglo-Norman lords who dwelt beyond the Pale began to become Gaelicized, just as the Norse who had settled Ireland had been. The Gaelic culture at the time was still extremely powerful, even if the invasion had brought it to a brilliant, fiery sunset. The language had some of the richest and most abundant literature and poetry in Europe outside of Latin or Greek. They had their own unique laws, customs, music, architecture, even clothing and hairstyles. And despite being Christian, they had their own traditions and ways of understanding God. Conquering Anglo-Norman lords started marrying with local women, sending their children to bardic schools, and after several generations, increasing numbers began to consider themselves Gaels. By the late 15th century, this had become a serious problem for the English, with local lords of Anglo-Norman ancestry increasingly allying with the Irish, and even leading Irish rebellions against the English crown. In 1542, Henry VIII had himself declared King of Ireland and set out to re-establish English domination over the whole of the island. He came up with a clever scheme of winning over the local Gaelic lords, but in return be granted official titles and command over the lands as members of the new Kingdom of Ireland, headed, of course, by Henry. But much to Henry's dismay, they continued to carry on in exactly the same way as they had before. Yet slowly, progressively, the English monarchy was unfolding a sinister plan. They were enacting a policy, referred to as the plantation. That is, they were taking lands from local Gaelic lords, and were having English migrants settle them. It must be understood that this wasn't an accident, it wasn't a natural phenomena. It was a strategic policy by the English crown in order to change the ethnic character of Ireland so that the English monarchy could more effectively control the island. While this process is best known from the plantations of Ulster, which most radically shifted the ethnic and religious landscape of the province, it was being rolled out across Ireland to lesser degrees. Ulster was singled out after the massive rebellion of the Nine Years' War, and full effort was put into changing the ethnic character of the most restive and resistant region of Ireland, so that it could never rise up again. Many English who had settled in Ireland generations before started to become known as Old English to differentiate them from the planters. Many Old English began to consider themselves as Gaels and adopt the language and culture. But the planters were very different. They were selected for being loyal to the crown, for being Protestants, and they were settled on stolen Gaelic lands, which developed further loyalty to the crown. The Reformation that the English were attempting to force on Ireland eventually led to a social explosion. In 1641, there was a full-scale rebellion which saw a united force called the Irish Catholics Confederation retake much of Ireland. Only Dublin remained in English hands. But in 1649, Oliver Cromwell assembled his new model army and set out to war. Over the course of three years of intense fighting, Cromwell's forces crushed the Irish Catholic Confederacy and enacted brutal suppression across the country. They banned ownership of land by any Catholic, and even forbade them from residing in towns. Nearly all Gaelic lands were seized and given to British Protestant settlers. It was estimated that up to 40% of the Gaelic population in Ireland, or 618,000 people, died during this repression. An additional 50,000 were taken as indentured laborers and sent to the far corners of the earth to serve as forced labor for the empire. Catholicism was officially banned and bounties were offered for the capture of priests. The Parliament of Cromwell offered lands in Ireland instead of payment for soldiers and financiers. 
Only 8% of Irish land remained in Irish hands during Cromwell's bloody rule. After the Restoration, some lands were returned to the Irish, but it only bring the number up to 20% of Irish land actually owned by Irish. Cromwell fulfilled the goal in bloody fashion of the colonization of Ireland through plantations, murder, and land theft. Further disaster was added to this between 1845 and 1852, when the Great Famine devastated predominantly poor, dispossessed Gaelic Ireland, killing one million people. A number of English elites openly argued at the time that the Irish should be allowed to starve to death. Whether or not the famine was orchestrated, the severe oppression that the Irish faced was what made them so poor and vulnerable to famine to begin with, which was a result of the policies of the English. While the famine ultimately led to the revolutionary movement that would finally free Ireland after hundreds of years of subjugation and colonialism, English rule and mass deaths had taken a severe toll on the Gaels. The language was quickly fading, along with many aspects of the traditional Gaelic culture. Revolutionary romantics, through their tireless work in the Gaelic revival, helped to preserve and keep what remained alive, yet the struggle continues. New problems face the Gaels, not so dissimilar from the old, despite self-rule. The ruling class of Ireland is more akin to the Pale than the Gael, with a global vision that cares little about the great ancestors of the past, monumental sacrifices of the Irish people, not for individual rights, but the struggle for collective freedom, for their identity and continuity as a people. As the great revolutionary and fiddy Patrick Pierce once said, not free merely, but Gaelic as well. Not Gaelic merely, but free as well. The Gaels share a common language, common myths, and from our earliest sources, they recognize themselves as a distinct ethnic group which traced back to a shared ancestry. That shared history and ancestry is real, and though it isn't perhaps exactly as they imagined it, it isn't really so far from reality. In the most ancient beginnings, man did emerge from the underworld, the realm of spirit. The Gaels really did originate from a people who migrated west from the lands of Scythia, spotted Ireland from across the waves, sailed across the waters, and won the land. Our ancestors are buried in the mounds. They were the makers of many wraths and cairns and circles, of great kingdoms and glorious deeds remembered through thousands of years. They are peasants and laborers and druids and priests, warriors and mothers and saints. Beneath the boughs of an oak I saw a lovely vision, a maiden fair green of cloak, devoid of all division. Sought the shelter of the leaf, a tear glistened in her eye. I asked, dear maiden of grief, what is the cause of thy sigh? For moors have come to my shores, I seek the lug reborn. I knew then Eru implores, the broad spear I must adore. Well, tasul lagum goreshishin simulaget. Not in termat gormalet, agis lista, grev mag of gleer as eishtacht. Marskanach, shas art.